All right, Coach. Welcome to CSL Podcast. CSL stands for Chess Sports Life. And what I like to do is find out what strategies you and other players use to help us be more successful in life. Because I figured out in chess and in basketball, there's strategies we can use to become better. Right. So my first question to every guest is, do you play chess? If so, who taught you? If not, what's your favorite board game or card game? Yeah. Um, I do not play chess. Okay. I, I actually just read a book, Chess vs. Checkers. Okay. That was that was pretty good. Pretty good. I liked it. Um, I play euchre. Okay. I'm not a I'm not a big poker guy, even though I watch some on ESPN every now and then. Okay. Um, How'd you get started with euchre? Huh? Just Indiana, just like you growing up, everybody played euchre. I thought the world played euchre. Okay. Right, but they didn't. No. Nope. Just, just people in the Midwest and Indiana, <laughs> and so but. Um, <clears throat> Like board games, like well, I grew up playing a lot of board games, but but not as much. Like, okay. Like going forward or anything. So our, our our game we play. My wife and I are partners. It, okay. It, it is euchre. So. Okay, that's yeah. cool. All right. So on this podcast, I break up the podcast in five sections. We got the preseason, regular season, All Star break, postseason, and off season. There you go. So as you know, in the preseason, it's all about yourself and individual workouts. Right. So this is all about you, Coach. Can you tell us about your team and how special you think it is? Yeah, or can be right. Well, we we have a very balanced team. Obviously, I think it, you know, it obviously starts with Zach Eady. Mm. You know, the reigning National Player of the Year. Just his physical abilities um, are so different than everybody else. With just you know elite size, the way he can move at that size. He's got good footwork. He's skilled, but he's also just kind of a baby in the game. So his first year of organized basketball was his sophomore year in high school. Wow. So when you look at it, and this is his seventh year, I always tell guys to go back and look at their careers and say, well, when did you start playing organized basketball? Most people are like, ah, second grade, first grade, third grade. I said, so like, he's a middle schooler, right? In terms of how many years of organized basketball. I played in a, a third grade league as a kindergartner. Wow. And so, like, you know, seven years after that, you know, obviously you're in, you know, you're sitting and going seventh, going into eighth grade. You're in middle school in terms yeah. of your stuff. So, you know, he's, you know, he's still getting better. He's still improving, which is the scary part. Um, we have, when I say a balanced team, I kind of mean from an offensive standpoint. Okay. We have a lot of guys that can really shoot the basketball mm. to go along with his size. We have a good front line and Caleb first, Trey Kaufman ran and Mason Gillis. It's kind of harder for those guys. Because Zach eats up thirty to thirty-five minutes every game, and rightfully yeah. so. Yeah. So like now, like it's you know, last year Trey Kaufman Wren got kind of the shorter minutes, and now Caleb First kind of gets the shorter minutes. But it's really not because of anything that they've done, because they're good players. It's because you're just keeping him in the game. Yeah. Um, cool. Braden Smith is an elite point guard. Oh, he so is. Yeah, yeah, he can pass the basketball. Um, really breaks down the defense in terms of what they're taking away what they're giving him, and then he just makes good decisions. He can knock down shots. He can score at the rim. Mm-hmm. Um, but his best attribute is his ability to pass, just his instincts. Then we have a lot of guys that can shoot. Lance Jones, Fletcher Lawyer, mm-hmm. Cam Heidi, uh, Miles Colvin. Colvin yeah, yeah. Can, can really shoot the basketball. Ethan Morton gives us a guy off the bench that can really defend. So just across the board, we have really good balance as a team. Um, we're a better probably often. We are a better offensive team. Then we are a defensive team, but we're a great rebounding team. When we take care of the basketball, we, we normally win. Well, this year we have won. Our two losses um, have been uh, when we didn't take care of the basketball and we turned it yeah. over. We've had a couple other games where we didn't, and we were able to survive and still win. But uh, just been a great group. We went overseas, international trip this summer. Mm-hmm. Spent a lot of time together, um, kind of working up to the season. So, you know, just, you know, was excited about this year. And obviously good. we put ourselves in a good spot. Yeah. Uh, as far as uh, Zach Eady and advantages your team has, how do you maximize your advantages when you're coaching? Right. Well, we had the last year, we had the number one free throw disparity in the country. So you're talking about 362 teams. So for the amount that uh, our opponents shoot, for the amount that we shoot, we had the we had the best difference. So we committed the fewest fouls in the country last year. So we, you know, from a position defense standpoint, not fouling, trying to get guys out of rhythm on the three point arc, mm. getting them into those tough twos is really what we just talk about, and then dominating the glass. So okay. for us, you know. You, you, you got to understand what the defense is going to do to defend him. And sometimes it's going to be different because other teams aren't going to guard um, us the way they guard everybody else yep. just because, because of him. Of e, yeah. yeah. So, like, you just kind of 
kind of wait and see sometimes within a game because you know they're going to do something different. You just don't know what they're going to do. But to us, we we think that's a positive for us because now you don't have a lot of practice doing what you're getting ready to do. True. And normally most people are pretty good in their doubles. They're not very good in their rotations. That's where people get messed up. So we'll overload sides. We'll do different things. We'll give different alignments. We'll screen when the ball goes in. So we try to do a lot of different things just to try to keep them off the scent. Um, and then if they just stay one-on-one, we've had people have success. Not a lot of people, but we've had people have some success at just staying one-on-one with him. Okay. Which most people get overpowered when that happens. Yeah, they will. Um, but, um, there are people that have had success that have done that. Uh, how significant is it that he that Edie has scored over 2,000 points and over 1,000 rebounds? How special is that? Yeah, you know, he's just been unbelievably productive. Like, you know what you're getting with him. He's very consistent. You know, he gives a great effort. He's not that big guy that kind of plays basketball because he's big. Mm-hmm. You know, he you know he's physical. Um, he embraces the physicality of the game. He works really hard, um, but he doesn't take a playoff. He goes after the ball at all times. Yeah, you how know? does that make you feel as a coach? Oh, it feels great. <laughs> it makes me feel like I'm a better coach. I know that's <laughs> right. <laughs> but, like, that keeps things in line. When your best player is a hard worker, that, that keeps things in line because if he's doing it and he's the best player, not just on your team, but the best player in college basketball, everybody else is going to fall in line. Yeah, I agree with that. All right, we'll move on to the regular season. Uh, shot selection, Coach. Yeah. I've heard you have some type of shot selection seminar. Could you explain yeah. to me, yeah. if I was some new player, what a good shot is? Yeah. Well, I think it's different. I don't like to talk in, in, uh, in theories and say, like, this is what we're going to do, like whatever, because each guy's got different parts mm-hmm. to their game. You know, some guys can handle it. Some guys can pass it. Some guys can shoot it. Some guys can do all of it. Um, if some guy doesn't, you know, use his left hand well, there's nothing in the rule book that says you got to use your left hand. Like, you know, we're going to work on it. We're going to try to get it better. But if it's still, you know, a weakness, like, let's stay away from that. So mm-hmm. really talk. What I try to educate them on is educate them on the past teams and the teams that we've had and, and talk to them about those personnels that we've had and how we played to our strengths and how each team was different in their own way, but okay. still at the end of the day, all of us were efficient. And so, like, I tried to let it kind of organically happen, especially when we were not as experienced. Mm-hmm. So if you got an experienced team come back, you got a better feel than when you got some guys that maybe you need some freshmen or sophomores to play huge roles. That's okay. a little bit different. So I like to let things organically work, but also let them understand, like, taking shots in rhythm. You know, if you're going to take a shot early in the shot clock, it should be a dunk layup or a wide open three. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. easy to understand. Yeah, easy to understand. Okay. And so, like, don't pass on those wide open threes. Okay. Don't pass on those layups. Don't pass on those deep post-ups early in the clock. But okay. when you don't, like, now you can't take early clock tough twos. So just like what we're preventing on defense, like, and saying, like, hey, we want those tough twos defensively. Now, oh, offensively, man. we want to stay away from that. Now, when the shot clock gets low – Maybe that runner, maybe that floater, maybe, you know, that tough two because, you know, you have to, you have to because right. you're up against the clock a little bit. So we talk on you keeping your dribble alive. We talk on playing on two feet and what's there. We okay. talk on attacking ball screens and the different coverages, um, about, you know. And so, you know, what are you doing early in the clock? What are you doing late in the clock? And now our efficiency of offensive plays and, and what we do, we have a system to where everything has a meaning. So you don't have a word, and then that's just the play. Everything has a meaning. So when you see sometimes we raise our our board during the game and you see five or six words, you're like, that's got to be confusing. Each word means something. Okay. And so now they know what to go to. It's like a different action? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have families in what we do. So if we go to a weave, it's, it's a particular family. Okay. If we go to a box set, it's a particular family. Okay. If we go to a certain alignment, it's a different family. And then we build off of that, and we do a lot of the same actions in those different families. It just appears differently. Okay. Yeah. And so, like, you know. And you built that across um, yes. as the season goes, right? So we start in, now we start in June because it's, it's only complex if you don't understand the meanings of the words. Right. Right as you understand the meanings of the words, like, you know how you get in the game and you walk out of a timeout and you look at your boy and you're like, hey, man, 
what do you say? Yeah. Like, like, yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah. Everybody does. Everybody you watch your does. teammate and you're like, hey, man, like, what do you say? Like, yeah, you're there for two running. minutes. Yeah. What are we running? <laughs> and so, like, now when you go to it, I always tell them when you get that block mm-hmm. in your head and you see that play, don't don't worry about it. What's the meanings? You gotcha. know the meanings. Like, you know, process that. Like, understand about – because when you get competitive and you get exhausted, like, you know, you get that brain freeze. Mm-hmm. And so, like, now we – even though it's a lot of stuff, it's really it's really simple. It, okay. Yeah, it's just the illusion of complexity. Okay, I love that, Coach. Yeah. Um, let me see the other one that I have. What do you tell your team after a hard loss, Coach? I, I try not to say as much as I want to say because you're frustrated and you're emotional at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I normally talk on possessions – you know, with the teams that we've had the last two or three years, not to take anything away from our opponents, but most of the time we've beat ourselves because our turnovers are too high or we've gotten out rebound. So in my 19 years here at Purdue, when we've been out rebounded and we've uh, had more turnovers, Don't we're six and 48. Yeah. When we've had more rebounds and less turnovers, we're 151 and 15. Yeah. So it kind of shows to them when you have a good team. When you out rebound people and you have fewer turnovers, it's going to take care of itself. Yeah. Like if you lose that, that's an outlier. Like you're you're going to win those. Like you're going to win ninety percent of those, eighty five percent of those games. And so just keep working from a possession battle of we're rebounding the basketball, we're taking care of the basketball. Okay. So you're saying, you're reiterating this to the players. So yes. My next question was going to be how do you get this across to these young players? Yeah. Well, then it's it's difficult. I think you get it across to the young players by just the repetition of it. You don't get off of it. Okay. Like the game, like you're selling the game to them and what wins, and it has nothing to do with them. Like you got to understand this. Like this is what was true before you, and this is what's going to be true after you. That's true. Like whoever gets the most – now, you can get more possessions of your opponent. They can shoot a poor percentage. You can shoot a high percentage. But it's, it's really hard to do yeah. if, like, you get – so say you have – 10 fewer turnovers and 10 more rebounds. You got 20 more possessions. You should win the game. Mm -hmm. You should win the game. But if you have more talent than them, you're going to win the game. Definitely. But if you got equal talent, you're 90, 85, 90% going to win the game. So like, that's the whole thing for them. And you know, simplicity wins the race. So like sometimes when you get to try to do too much, like, like just understand, like keep that thing simple. So especially like, with the lineup that we have. People overdo Zach Eady. They give too much help. They take away too much. So, like, now, like, guys, like, some of the shots that you make in a game, like, you go back and look and, like, well, no one's even challenging your shot because they've just overdone him and given him too much help, and now you just got a wide-open look. Mm -hmm. So, like, keep getting those wide-open looks. So when guys miss shots that are good shots, like, I'm always overly positive. Like, yeah, I can't be positive. I'm a process-based guy, not a results-based guy. You still have my questions, Coach. Because <laughs> every interview that I've heard, you talk about the positivity. Like in the yeah. Northwestern game, after the game, you said you wanted to keep the guys positive. Why are you so focused on that? Yeah, because it's your psychic as a player. It's how you feel a lot of times. Like, you have the ability to play or you wouldn't be here. Now you got to make guys feel good. If you're not doing your job or you're trying to go against the grain in terms of like, I don't have to box out. I don't have – I told you to stay tight in ball screens, and now you go under ball screens. Like, if you're just going against what we're asking you to do, like, I got a problem with that. But if you're doing what I ask you to do and you're just coming up a little bit short, like, you got to encourage them. Okay. The result's not what we want, but you're trying to do what we ask you to do. So, like, other night, like, we were doing some good things, but we were missing our free throws. Mm-hmm. So no one's trying to miss their free throws. Right. So, like, don't get frustrated and stomp your foot and act like a fool. Like, that guy at the line is trying to make him. Like, that's cool. Like, if he doesn't want to box out, then get after him. So that, to me, is when guys are trying to pull the rope all in the right direction. Like, man, be positive with them. Like, encourage them. Sometimes it's difficult, especially, like, when you got to make a decision to take somebody out. Like, you know, now it's, you know, you know how that feels. Like, as a yeah. player, you know how that feels. So just, like try to get them on the right page and if they got to go back in the game and say like hey man you're doing some good things here but we got to be a little bit better our attention to details got to be a little bit better but in the big picture of things you're doing what you're supposed to 
but you know, okay. get through that screen or. So, like, in your coaching meetings, are you encouraging the assistant coaches yes. to do that? Okay. okay, and that's what I always tell them. Like, man, I don't don't be that way. Like, don't be results based. Now, you got somebody with bad body language. You got somebody, you know, that's being disrespectful. You got somebody who's not giving their full effort. If you're not running hard, or you're not boxing out, or you're not sticking to our ball scheme rules or our post rules, hey man, like talk to talk to them about it. Mm-hmm. If that keeps happening. Like now, you got to change as a coach because what you're doing is not working. Like now, I'm going to be positive the whole way through. Now, if you're going to like not do it, now I might jump you and get after you. But it's after you know three or four times, right? To what? But it's also like, where's the trust? Like you guys got to trust, like like me. But I got to earn your trust first. Like, but it's a two way street. So like you know, basketball doesn't come down to whether you're good or not because if you're good enough, like. You're here, right? That's the end. Yeah, like, 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 like this isn't a school like district. Like, right. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so like I feel you're good enough, or you wouldn't be here. Now, do I trust you? And like sometimes early in somebody's career, you know, if, if you get in practice and we go through things and talk about things, and you're not listening or you don't do what you're supposed to, or or simply you got the ability to do things but you struggle to retain information, like you know, they always say couldn't and wouldn't. It's the same result. Yeah. Like, you know, I can't do this. It's the same thing as a guy that can do it that won't oh, do it. Yeah. The result's the same. So, like, now sometimes guys are good enough. They got the ability to do it. They're just not quite ready. You okay. know, and so now they got to go through a learning process of either playing and struggling or watching and figuring it out, which you'd rather play and, and work through it. But, like, we got a really good team. Yeah, so, like, we got a lot of options to go to. Okay. Uh, to me, it sounds like, your continued success is because you're process based. Do you agree? And can you speak to why people, more people, should be process based instead of results based? Yeah. Well, first of all, our ultimate success is because our players. I think we've done not a good job of recruiting. I think we've done a great job at evaluating, of finding the right guys that fit. Um, getting skill is really important. If you can get, which we've proven we can, good big guys. If you surround them with skill. You just created space on the court. Mm-hmm. like And so the process base versus the result base, everybody wants to win. So if you're just going to be mad at people because you lose, like you're never going to really have winning ways. So like work on having winning ways. So I always say in a win, you're making mistakes. And in a loss, you're doing good things. Make sure you see it from both lens. Okay. But help your guys. So we really got to... Um, we had a player a while back, really good player. Name is not important. Um, <laughs> and, you know, he just struggled with constructive criticism in front of people. And so I just said, you know what he needs? I said, he needs individual film sessions when no one's in the room so we can find out what he's thinking. We can find out what he's, what he's getting. And, like, because it's not as much as this is Matt Painter's team and damn it, do what I say. It's like, just try to figure out who you're talking to. And it's like, hey, man, like, this isn't connecting. Or, like, you're getting emotional. Like, what's the deal? And, like, no one's in the room, so they're not going to take it personal. Right. But now when they're getting corrected, they're not getting a correct in front of a room of their peers. Mm -hmm. Now, if that person's trying to do everything you're asking them to do, then good. Now, if that person is not, like we talked about earlier, trying to do what you're asking them to do, then, like, that's going to happen. We're going to have to correct you in front of a group of people. But that seemed to me like a light bulb went off in my head there and just say, like, hey, I I just, I just, because I could have used that. (laughs) I just thought at it, just like, don't shame somebody, man. Mm. Like, you know, shame's shame's a a tough deal. We all live through shame at times. It's a real tough deal. And so, like, don't do that to them. Like, man, he, if he's trying to do what you're asking him to do, but we're still having some struggles, let's get to the root of it. Say, man, like, what are you thinking right here? Like, well, like, like you tell me what we should be. Because the one thing, if you want to learn about somebody else, don't tell them things, ask them questions. Yes. Yeah, because you've got to know what they know and you got to know what they don't know. And now you can get to the root of the problem. Like, a lot of people won't own their stuff. And a lot of times when, when things go down, I know I can fix me. So I got to own my mistakes I got to fix me. Now I can move on and help fix you. Yes. But if I don't fix me, and then I try to get them to come from that, like you go and fix yourself. Like, okay. like understand that. Like, be honest with yourself. Like, you know, whatever you do in this business, if you lose, they're going to get on you for what you don't do. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> and it's style. So if you're a pressing team and you lose, 
hey, man, why didn't you play half-court man-to-man? <laughs> if you're a half-court man-to-man guy, why didn't you zone? Right. If you mix everything up, then why didn't you stay with one thing? You're never going to be good at anything unless you get with one thing. Like, So you get some really high-level coaches. Like Dean Smith was a guy that changed a lot. Yeah. He trapped ball screens. He, he had his point zone. You know, he would toke and press back to his uh, point zone. He would, you know, he would just do a lot of different would, things. Yeah. And then he would always say, we're really not that great at anything because we do so much. Mm. But we have very good players. We have very talented players. Um, and then we're going to force you to change. And we're going to force you to think. And we're going to force you to do different things. Yeah. But it worked at North Carolina. Yeah, and it yeah. worked with the people that he got. Does that work everywhere? No. No. No, but that worked for him. So, like, if you look at legendary coaches like John Thompson and what they did. So, like, John Thompson from, you know, from Georgetown, you know, Big John, you know, that they would get to a 1-3-1. They would get to their zone. They would pressure man-to-man. They could get into you. But they had they had the guys, and they had the backline guys when you got beat to erase those, you know, shots. You know, with yeah. Patrick Ewing and Dikembe and Alonzo, Alonzo Morning, Morning, Michael yep. Graham. Like, they had so many guys. So it was perfect for how they played. But, like, if you're going to play that way, nobody plays that way in the Big Ten. Like, nobody plays how Dean Smith played. Right. Nobody plays how Big John Thompson played. But in the ACC at that time, in those times with the guys that they got, it was perfect. It was perfect in the Big East with how they played and their personnel at Georgetown. So, like, when you look at things, like, I steal a lot from other people, but I don't okay. steal everything. Okay. I, I take a little from here and a little from here. Then I, like, I just try to get it. But the people that I look up to and the people I've stolen from more than anybody are the best coaches in the Big Ten. You okay. know, the Tom Izzo's, the Bob Knight's, the Gene Cady's, like, okay. on down the line because where are you coaching? In the Big Ten. Coaching in the Big Ten. <laughs> and so, like, you know, man-to-man pressure defense and understanding of, like, like where that gets you. And, like, because, as you know, there's, there's games that you don't make your free throws. Mm-hmm. There's games that you get good shots, but you just don't make them. But defense and rebounding always travel. Yep. So that always goes, your jumper sometimes doesn't go in your book bag, you know. <laughs> but the other things, you know, they do. Yeah. So understand what the constants of the game are, but also understand, like, like, like have a system and have an understanding of what you think is best for where you're at with your personnel. You know, you got to be able to make some adjustments at times, but be strong in your convictions. A lot of people are just result-based. Yes. And then if you lose, it's like, you should have done this, you should have done this, you should have done this. Well, we've won 90% of our games. Like, so you're going to be upset these two games, and you're going to be happy these 20 games. You can't have it that way. It's competition. There's another yep. team out there. Like what, you, what does that do to the psyche of the players? I, you know, you got to get guys to understand that it works for them. Like, and so, like, when you sell those things from the beginning about taking care of the basketball, well, how are we going to take care of the basketball? You, you talk about, like, dominating the glass. Well, how are we going to dominate the glass? So when you do your drill work and you do your things every day and you build your habits, those habits become who you are mm-hmm. or lack thereof. So if you have shortcomings in certain areas, like we've turned the basketball over in some critical games in the past and then haven't had success in, in, the, in March Madness. Yep. And so people are like, well, why would you do that? Like, we're working on those things so we don't do that. But there is another team out there in this competition. But for us, it's not been as much about the opponent as it's been our unforced errors. And then we've just missed some wide open shots. shots yeah. But we've had in those two games that we've gotten beat by, in the last two games, one in the Sweet 16 and one in the first round, like we have high turnovers. Mm-hmm. And then we have high volume threes because they're leaving us wide open and low percentage. So that combination right there, when you're not getting as many possessions as you want, and then you're getting good shots, but you're just missing wide open shots, you know, is a recipe for disaster. For real. You, you got to make some shots. Like yeah. every, everybody would say in a game, you got to make some shots. But for us, we know that that might happen again. You might miss those shots, but those turnovers can't happen can't again. Happen. Right. Like that's where, you know, when, when you stay on those pillars of the game with the rebounding and taking care of the ball, that's where that mindset's got to be. Okay. All right, Coach, this section is called All-Star. This is where I get uh, – this is the All-Star break. I give the person I'm interviewing flowers, so I got something to show you, okay? Okay. Boy, LeRoy. Yeah. Hard hat. Go to work. 
When times get tough, got a boiler up. Grab hard hat, lunch fail, go to work. Grind it out and let the defense do the talking first. Offensively, we solid like a J. Covert. Together, we protected Mackie, that's not hurt. Let the spirit of John Wooden fill the space. And Gene Caddy, let him come in and motivate. Matt Payton got this strategy so he can preparate. Get him ready for the season, innovate. So when they starting up the engines, they can win the race. Transition, gotta push it, increase the pace. Increase the pace. Then get it up to Edie, he deep in the paint. Let him dunk it in their face. Yeah. And Gillis playing D all day. Turn him over, get the ball back for another play. Another play. Randy Smith pull up, hit the tray. Hit the tray baby. All day, we just boil her up. Boil her Hard up. hat, lunch pail, we just go to work. Go to work. All day, we just boil her up. Hard hat, lunch pail, we just go to work. Hard work is how we play. On target, got that long range. Every player on the team can hit that deep tray. And when we break national champs is what we say. All day, we just boil her up. Hard hat, lunch pail, we just go to work. All day, we just boil her up. Hard hat, lunch pail, we just go to work. Hard work is how we play. On target, got that long range. Every player on the team can hit that deep tray. And when we <laughs> That's no chance, what we say. Boiler up. Heavy. What'd you think, Coach? That's cool, man. That, <laughs> that was me rapping. Oh, was it? Yeah, that was me. What'd you think? Oh, that was great. Coach John Wooden. I don't know if you've seen this clip or not, but it's one where he talks about something he learned from Will Chamberlain. Okay. Have you heard that one? I have not. So he heard Will Chamberlain. He was going to a new team, and they asked Will if this coach would be able to handle him. And Will said, you handle things, not people. And John Wooden said he had just written a book where he talked about handling people. And he went home that night and redacted all of that. Yeah. And he said, you work with people, you don't handle them. What's your thoughts on that? That's great. That's great. It's true because, like, when you get a player, like, you're, you're trying to help them get to their maximum potential within a team and that's where issues happen <laughs> you know i always say like everybody wants to play shortstop and lead off yes. right? yeah like, <laughs> and, and i got you right we like we we all want take the most shots we all want to be the guy like there's nothing wrong with wanting that it's understanding within this team you got to be able to play a role within the guy so what i start off with because when people talk recruiting, they just talk offense. Mm -hmm. They're really not talking about anything else. But what gets you on the floor early in your career? Defense. Defense. Everybody knows that. Take yeah. care of the ball, guarding your man, knowing what's going on. That's what gets you on the court. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I just tell them, here's how I'm going to use you when if you can become one of our top two or three scores. If you can become one of our top two or three scores, here's how I'll use you. And then I show them clips. If you don't, then you're going to have to be able to play a role that fits around those top two or three scores. Yeah. You know, you got to understand that. I go, now, if that's not real appealing to you, that this is me talking to you as a junior in high school, you're just going to understand that midway through your freshman year in college. <laughs> that's true. That's when you're going to, that's just, that's facts. So I try to be that honest with them in recruiting and be that direct with them. Okay. Now I try to project where I see them. But I always tell them, it's a projection. I go, you come in here and you beat somebody out who started, it is yours. You come in here and you don't, it's not. Yeah. It's not yours. It's not his either. He's got to earn that. So like, but you also got to understand our five most talented guys or our five best offensive guys or whatever might not start. Like we got to field a team that works together. And sometimes that's a little role playing as you start a season when you're not as experienced. When you're a little bit more experienced, you understand some things. Yeah. Like you understand like certain things and you learn from things. You learn. I like sticking with guys. I like so they can grow and build, but you got to get yourself in that position. So we have a deep team now. We got a couple guys that don't play for us that I feel very comfortable them playing. They're just not ahead of the next guys. And so like that's to me, that's frustrating for them, because I know how they, f they feel as being a former player, but I also know our staff has done a really good job of bringing in a lot of good guys that fit at Purdue. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's, that's a good problem to have. So, like, I always say a great team has more than five starters, and we do. Good, okay. But, like, 
Like we could go as deep as twelve guys. We really, we really could. I just can't play that many guys. Yeah. Like I, I have a tough time getting to ten. I've played ten this year a little bit. There's about four or five games where I haven't, and I've played nine. Um, but nine's about where we're at. I really have played probably eight more. Okay. In that rotation, so it's different. But it, it just is one of those deals where when you start to play nine and ten or whatever, you know, you get eight minutes, you get eight minutes, you get eight minutes. And now, like, are we really getting anything from any of you when you scratch off that eight and now you can slide up and that guy gets 12 and that guy gets 12 and he doesn't get any, you get a, you get more from them. So the whole yeah. thing is, like, in your minute distribution, it's the, the greater value that you bring to your team. And sometimes that stinks because then a guy is left not playing. Okay. And, uh, who you think's a good player, right? Right. But like, that's where you are in your numbers. So that's a okay. difficult thing. So, but I, I just try to be honest with them. But okay. I also don't try to say things that aren't true. Like you're not doing this, you're not doing that because some of the things you're saying, the guys that do play, they're not doing those things either, right? That's true. And yeah. so as a player, I know how you feel. And so like, so I know it's frustrating when a guy sits on the bench and really why he's not playing. His weaknesses are why he's not playing, but yet you got guys you are playing that have those weaknesses too. So, like you know, sometimes in in coaching, it's you got to make that decision, and then you got to move forward with it and grow with it, and that's that's part of coaching, and that's that's a tough piece that as is. a coach, but it's also tougher to feel as a player. Yeah, I love that. Uh, can you say something about uh, Bruce Weber and Coach Conzo Martin? Yeah, yeah. Um, Bruce Weber helped recruit me here. You know he's an assistant, so you can't you can't give him credit for recruiting a bad player. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, but no, he was uh, you know a mentor to me. You know he was a guy that hired me at Southern Illinois. Um, learned a lot from him. You know a straight up guy. And so like I worked for a guy at Eastern Illinois, Rick Samuels, a straight up guy. And so my first two Division One jobs that I worked, you know I was fortunate to be around people that. You know, abided by the rules. You know, guys that did things the right way. Guys that cared about people. You know, and then they they gave everything to their players and wanted to see them do well. So I feel fortunate because those are the people that molded me by just being themselves. You know, and and, and that was like, you know, huge. Like because now, like I see people getting in trouble in the business and guys not doing what they're supposed to. Well, a lot of them just did what they saw the people do in front of them. Yes, they didn't invent the trick. You know, now all of a sudden they're cheating or cutting corners because they think that's what they have to do to be successful in the business. And then the guys have been rewarded for that. And yeah. that's that's not what it's about. I was just blessed to be around guys that, like a Bruce Weber, that did things that he was supposed to. He was a good coach, mm -hmm. um, understood basketball, um, always had his teams prepared, um, worked hard at it. And, and so like that, I, you know, I learned a lot from him and owe a lot to him um, for where I am in my career. Um, Conzo Martin was obviously a teammate of mine, probably my favorite player. Oh, really? At Purdue. Okay. Yeah, just a two-way player. You know, a, a guy that had a lot of adversity, mm -hmm. you know, had injuries, you know, has had personal adversity, beaten cancer. Yeah. Grew up in East St. Louis. Like, never heard him make an excuse when he had <laughs> cancer, whatever. Mm -hmm. Never made excuses. So, like, trying to find those those great players and find those great people and that, that combination like, you know, that's the that's the key. That's the key in evaluating is find the right people for your program and the right, you know, because he's a multi Conzo's a multiplier. He makes other people better. Yeah. You know, he made people better as a teammate. He made people better as an assistant. He made people better when he was a head coach. Like, that's what he does. Like, that's his strength of reaching other people and helping other people out. But, like, you know, he was here when we got it started. It was, it was, a, it was a tough deal when we started. Um, we weren't very good. Uh, coaches last year, we won seven games. My first year, we won nine games. So in those 16, we won 16 games in two years. Wow. It's the worst two-year period in the history of Purdue basketball. So my first two years back here. So, but, like, who was with you that got it going? Like Paul Lusk, like Elliot Bloom, like Todd Foster. Like, you know, we, we had to get it going. Like, and Conzo Martin was there, and he was a part of the old staff. And, like, that connectivity – you know, David Teague and, and uh, Carl Landry were two big pieces right there that got us rolling. Yep. You know, Pike grad. Gotta give, That's gotta, right, David gotta Teague. Got to give him that Pike some love. Yep. <laughs> and, um, but no, those guys were, uh, those were great. But no, Zoe was somebody that, that helped us get it going. 
but really what helped us get us going is 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 that class is the mm-hmm. Juwan Johnson, each one more, yes. Robbie Hummel. Like that was you got to have some people here to get you going to start, and that was that was Carl Landry, that was David Teague. We we sprinkle on Chris Kramer and Keaton Grant, and then we get that big class to go with them. And now you have JJ, each one, and Rob, and now you already have KG, and then you have CK. And so like now, like that, now you got something going. Zoe yep. was a big piece of that. Paul okay. Russell was a big piece of that. So like now he takes off and gets head coaching job, and he's not with us. But we never get off the ground without him. Okay. We just don't. We, we, we just simply don't. I think that's something for me is I delegate a lot as a coach. Doesn't mean I don't know what's going on. Doesn't mean that I'm not hands-on because I am, but I delegate a lot. But I also delegate a lot from a recruiting standpoint. I want to go out and see things myself. I want to do some things. But you got to be able to have assistants that know what works for me, what works for Purdue, and what works for our system. Yep, love it. Last question, Coach. Can you talk about the impact your father had on your life? Yeah. Well, my dad was uh, was an attorney. He actually, still works mm. at seventy eight. Uh, I, I don't think he works as hard as he did when he was thirty eight. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he was someone who coached me when I was little. So he coached me from kindergarten to fifth or sixth grade. So he coached me in little league baseball up until about fourth grade. He coached me in basketball up until sixth grade. So when I was a fourth grader, he poured a fifty foot slab concrete in our backyard and we had a full court basketball court with floodlights oh yeah we had pine trees on the side Uh that knocked the wind down a little bit and that was our field of dreams like that was our that's where we played and that's where we did things so basketball was his passion that obviously became my passion okay he actually coached little kids basketball before my brother and i were old enough to play little kid basketball because he wanted to know what he well, I guess he wanted to know what, what he was supposed to do and how he was supposed to do it. Okay. So when we became old enough to play, like now he was coaching and knowing what was like what he was doing and stuff. So um, like no, but he was a big part of that. And and so we would go around. He graduated from Indiana, so don't hold that from against him. From IU? Yeah. Okay. okay. So don't hold that against him. He got his <laughs> law degree from there too. Okay. But he would take me around. I'm trying to think of the people that we would go and see. Like, he took me to see Steve Alford a couple times. Oh, wow. A guy named Rick Rowray that played at Muncie Central. Okay. That went to Indiana. Uh, um, we went and saw John Flowers at Fort Wayne South, South Side. Um, we saw Tracy at Homestead. Um, we, we, we saw, like, a lot of, like, different guys that Indiana would sign. Okay. And then we like you go and see not all of them or nothing, but he'd take me here and take me there. We go to Indiana games. Like we were in we were in Assembly Hall in eighty one when Indiana went to the final four. I got in the locker room afterwards. So like okay. we were big Bobby Knight fans. Like we were big. But the thing that I'll probably respect the most about him, especially now in the business that I'm in, that he had the wherewithal to understand when Purdue started to recruit me, they didn't try to sign me early. They waited and they had some guys either transferring or they needed somebody or whatever the deal was. And, you know, my first knee jerk reaction was, am I going to Purdue? I hate Purdue. Like I'm an Indiana fan. <laughs> right, right? Like you did. And he just said, Hey man, like this is a business decision. Like you're, you're you got to do what's best for you. He goes, let me tell you something about Purdue and Gene Katie. He goes, they always overachieve with their teams. They always play hard. And Purdue's got a great education. He goes, I'm not telling you, you got to go to Purdue. He goes, but I'm telling you, you got to listen to him. Okay. And so, like, he, that opened up, you know, my ears to listen, to be like, okay, listen to what they're doing. And I really didn't, like, fall in love with Purdue. I, I fell in love with Gene Cady. And, like, when he came in, like, his directness kind of turned me off, but it didn't turn my dad off. So, like, back then, like, sometimes you could stay in the summer or you could go home. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, 40 years ago, guys didn't stay in the summer. School was out. They went home, and three and a half months later, they came back to school. Like, that's the way it was. Yep. Then when people started staying in the summer, they saw, oh, man, you're getting six extra credit hours in the summer. You're getting better as a player. Like, this yep. makes sense for these guys to stay in the summer because your team can grow, and then you help towards your diploma and getting your credit hours. You know, so with all of that, like, when you're looking at, like, what's best for you, like, He's sitting there saying this to me, and he's being so direct with me. He walks out, and I go, man, Dad, I don't know about that dude. And he just said, let me tell you something. This was a home visit. <laughs> and, I, and he goes, 
That's the only person who came through here and told you the truth. Mm, that's big. And he just goes, I'm not saying other people lied to you. He goes, I'm just saying he painted the real picture for you. And he just goes, I just think you can trust him. He goes, I just think he's, you know, he's a man's man. You can trust him. And what's crazy, what's I always, fin I, I tell this story a lot. What's crazy is 15 years later, almost to the day, he got me this job as a head coach. Because I don't get this job without him. Wow. Yeah, he didn't hire me. The AD hired me. The president hired me. The board of trustees hired me. But if he would have popped up and said, no, nah, no, no way. There's no way they would have done that. Okay. Like he had to give the blessing. But so here I am sitting there as a snotty-nosed kid at 18, <laughs> like IU fan, and my old man saying, dude, you need to go to Purdue. Like, And to 15 years later, I'm the next head coach at Purdue. Like, It was very, very, very surreal. But I think like just as much as I made a basketball decision to come to Purdue, what my dad was saying was, like, you're making a life decision. Like, and then that's, that's kind of cool. And then like, you know, I needed Gene Cady way more than he needed me. And that's hard to see through an 18 year old lens. Yeah. So my dad being in his mid forties at the time, he could see that and that, and, and look where we are. Like, exactly. like it never would have happened without it. Like, and so like, when you say that, like, like I'm, I'm very grateful that uh, the wise old man helped me. Yes, me yes. too. Yeah. Thank you, coach. Oh, well, thank you, man. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. Grab hard hat, lunch pail, go to work. Go to work. Grind it out and let the defense do the talking first.